welcome to Shrinking Cities in the U.S. and China, Challenges and Responses. This event is a special joint effort between the Libertal Vogel Center for Chinese Studies, Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning, and the United States Heartland China Association. Uh, my name is Min Fan. I'm the U.S. Heartland China Association Executive Director. We are honored to collaborate with such esteemed universities. And we also want to thank our supporter, Ford Foundation and Henry Booth Foundation. Without their support, this public program would not have been possible. And without further ado, I want to do three quick housekeeping. One, Q&A. Please enter any question you have through the Q&A. We did receive a lot of questions already pre-submitted. Our panel will do their best to answer as many of them as possible. And secondly, there's language interpretation available. One of the presentations is in Chinese. So be sure to click that globe symbol on your toolbar at the bottom of the Zoom window. Pick English if you cannot understand both Chinese and English. So again, that's the English channel. Finally, at the end, we would really appreciate if you can take a minute to give us a feedback. Now, let me turn to our board member, Tom Ostrander, to tell you a little bit more about the U.S. Heartland China Association and the unique collaboration we are uh, engaged tonight. Tom? Thank you very much, <clears throat> Min, and thank you very much, uh, uh, Lan, for all the work uh, putting uh, uh, this going forward. A brief uh, story about the United States Heartland China Association, which is a uh, 501c3. Um, we call ourselves bipartisan. We're really not so much involved with uh, political actions. We have political connections and we have policy explanations. Um, and, and so forth. Um, the Heartland Association uh, has 20 states that are part of it that basically go from the Gulf of Mexico up to the Great Lakes. So it has a variety of some states that are uh, southern. There are some that are industrial, including states like Ohio, Michigan, uh, Illinois, and so forth. There are also a great deal of agricultural uh, companies which are very uh, relevant to uh, engagements with uh, China. Um, the uh, uh, What we try to do is support a positive, productive, mutually benefit is really central. Non-zero-sum positive would be the way some folks uh, would call it. Um, using experience networks, connections, and so forth uh, to pursue that. Um, if you're ask us to, to asking me to describe it in about um, seven words, I would say they all start with the letter C. Communications, collaborations, cooperations, courtesy, communities, which will be a feature uh, tonight also known as infrastructure, but communities. Um, competition, everything from ping pong uh, which is coming up very close to its 50th anniversary. Uh, I had the personal thrill and privilege to be a senior at the University of Michigan in Chrysler with a C arena uh, when the PRC team came in, uh, having challenged the U.S. team and uh, the Chinese team really did quite well, to say the least, um, in any event. So we try to bring uh, people together and discuss all of these uh, all of these things. Um, Detroit is an interesting uh, story because it's been very involved with the University of Michigan in a variety of way. A number of the different uh, colleges, of which at least uh, four are being uh, are involved, and I think uh, Min had highlighted uh, them. Uh, but they, um, the city, interestingly enough, when I was very young, uh, had a million and a half people. Uh, it now has about 700,000. So it's shrinking. It's not a small shrinking town, but it lost 800,000. Uh, simultaneously, Nashville, where I live, went from 700,000 to a million five. But I, I, I digress. Um, I think that there were a number of engagements um, with uh, China and Detroit, one that I'll just highlight. 
uh, was when masks were very, very scarce and other PPEs in the early stages of COVID and other C that we didn't invite into the room. Uh, a number of P PPEs were uh, given to various organizations in Detroit, predominantly uh, Life Remodeled, which is in the heartland of uh, Detroit. So we do a, a lot of different things, a lot of education oriented. Um, our delegations have really been on, on hold for quite a while, uh, but we do have various um, uh, situations where we have students on both sides of the Pacific participate, share views about their education and their uh, country. Uh, I won't ramble on much longer uh, because there are too many interesting people to speak and to uh, uh, teach us uh, things. Uh, I won't ramble because I learn much more when I listen and I really look forward to the remainder of the evening. With that, Lan Deng has posted herself onto the theater. So I will uh, leave it to uh, her for the next step. Thank, Thank you, Tom. Yeah. So, hi, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us tonight or in the morning, I think, depending where you are. So my name is London. I am a professor of urban and regional planning and the associate director for the Nibos Orogo Center for Chinese Studies. And as Tom, I, first, I want to thank the U.S. Heartland and China Association for working with us to putting together this program, especially Minfan and Jixin County for their hard work. So the Nibos Orogo Center for Chinese Studies is an interdisciplinary academic unit that is committed to promoting a deeper understanding of China's past and present. So this year, we are celebrating our 60th anniversary. I would like to play a short video to show what we have done and what we will continue to do. So please bear with me. I will share the video.
So, so we, are, we are, we are very, very, can you guys hear me? A little bit of a breakup. So we are very glad that this evening we have our benefactor, Mr. Rich Roga, be with us tonight and whom our center is named after. So I will let Tom introduce Mr. Roga and he will speak, he will speak for a few words. Tom, please. Th thank you very much. And, and thank you, Mr. Rogo. Um, Mr. Rogo and I have known each other uh, a, a bit from a distance, but with some regularity over a variety of University of Michigan uh, events. In some cases, uh, major fundraising is part of uh, Mr. Rogel's very extensive <laughs> philanthropic activities across uh, a whole variety of different things um, on both sides of the, uh, of the Pacific. Um, he's had major engagements in a whole variety of way, really a list too long for me to go through uh, with the PRC in a variety of ways. And it's really become, uh, I don't think it's exaggerating to say a passion in terms of his exploration, education, uh, learning and so forth after a very successful uh, uh, financial and uh, um, entrepreneurial and professional uh, list of things that would also be very long in terms of his many um, successes. Um, I would also like to say that the LRCCS really has maintained an extraordinary tradition that the University of Michigan um, has had uh, for quite a while. Uh, there's a fantastic book that's out called the University of Michigan in China. And I think one thing that I think Mr. Rogo would agree to, uh, since his enterprise within the University of Michigan has been for 60 years, which we all congratulate. Uh, but the important statement is on the page of this book, which was written by David Ward and Eugene Chen in 1917, uh, nine, yeah, 2017, excuse me, um, that, so it's covered quite a variety of administrations, but the most important words, and they really should set the theme for how we think of ourselves this evening, for every step, step of China's growth and transformation in the last century and a half, 150 years, the University of Michigan has walked right alongside China. I think that's one of the most powerful published comments uh, about a United States um, entity uh, speaking about its perspectives of China. I may have gone on too far, but with that, Mr. Rogel, I'd like to uh, hand it over to you for any remarks you would like to make, including any char characterizations that I might have made about you. But we'll skip the characters, characterizations about me. I first went to China in 1993. Uh, along, it was a University of Michigan uh, uh, group that went, including uh, former Ambassador Leonard Woodcock. And he said something that has stuck with me and probably is mostly important in this time in that sometimes our governments don't get along, but the people of China love Americans and Americans love China. I have found that to be very, very true. I, the, the, you know, if you, if you just read the newspapers right now, nobody's getting along, et cetera. I have to tell you that um, with the COVID uh, virus and the cooperation between Peking University Health Science Center and the University of Michigan has been outstanding. Um, that not only did they provide uh, PPE for us, but we were in constant contact learning what they learned when they sent their physicians to Wuhan. And what we have been able to work with them on trying to conquer this, this terrible epidemic. The thing with the cities, this is, a, this is just one example of the important discussions that we need to have where we can take the experience of, of both countries and make one plus one equal three. I mean, you, if you live in Michigan, you see what's happened to the city of Detroit, even though it's coming back, it's been a disaster. 
But if you go over to China and take the train from Guangzhou back to Hong Kong, you see all the closed factories, which is a, which is a tremendous symbol of how things change. I am very anxious to, uh, for tonight's program, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much. We really appreciate all that you've done in so many different uh, perspectives and uh, all of which have some relevance with this evening. I think, uh, uh, Alain, at, at this point, the microphone goes back to you for uh, some of the rest of our uh, uh, panelists. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Rich, for very powerful remarks. So now, now we, are turn, we will turn to our main program today on shrinking cities in the US and China. And so what are shrinking cities? And we know that shrinking cities are cities that have experienced considerable population loss and also the loss of economic activities. And we also know that these losses can be triggered by many reasons, but most commonly is economic transformation. But this economic transformation may come because of shape in labor demand due to technology innovation or increased competition among regions, right, both domestically and globally. And all these may have led to uneven development. So we have seen cities striving, while well, some cities striving, while others may have lagged behind. But demographic factors can also play a very important role. For example, a couple of months ago, we know that both the Chinese and the US governments released their most recent census data. And interestingly, both countries have reported the slowest rate of population growth in decades. And this is not just a US or China phenomenon. Many other countries have also been seeing those Man. That's what that's why we have brought four terrific scanners from both the US and China to talk about those issues. Each of our speakers have spent years in studying shrinking cities and will have a lot to offer for us. So what we will do is for each speaker to speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, and I will introduce each of them briefly before their talk. You can find their full bios at our event website. So after the four presentations, we will then have moderated discussion to address questions from the audience. The audience, please submit your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So here is the order of the presentations. We will first have Mr. Alan Malik to talk about the efforts in helping small shrinking cities in the US. Second, we will have Professor Jiang Hui Yu to talk about China's old industrial and resource cities and what the Chinese government has been doing in helping those places. Third, we will have Professor Yin Nong to talk about the urban design strategies to tackle the issues in the built environment for cities that have lost. Finally, we will have Professor Brit Rock his experience of studying shrinking cities in both the US and China, and then how can countries learn from each other. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Alan Malik. Mr. Malik is a senior fellow with the Center for Community Progress in Washington, DC. He also teaches in the Graduate Center on Planning and the Environment at the Pratt Institute in New York City. He is an internationally known expert on older industrial cities. Mr. Malik has been the author of many books, articles, and research studies. His most recent book is The Divided City, Poverty and Prosperity in Urban America which explores the uneven effects of urban revival on lower-income residents and communities of color. With that, I will turn the floor over to Alan. Please, Alan. Well, thank you, Min. Thank you, Lan and Min. And before I begin, I would like to see if I can share my screen. Let's see, there I am. And so I'm gonna talk about small shrinking post-industrial cities in the United States, and particularly about the nature of their economies and why they have essentially developed a new economy. There really isn't an economy at all. But first, by way of context, 
I'd like to raise a question. This is the basil one of the most famous Byzantine basilicas in the world. It sits in the middle of a cow pasture a few kilometers south of the Italian city of Ravenna. And the reason it sits in a cow pasture is because when it was built, it was in the center of a prosperous city called Classe, which was a major port of the time. Once the harbor silted up and the city's economic function had disappeared, the city essentially disappeared. Everybody moved elsewhere. The bricks and stones were taken to build elsewhere, but people preserved the basilica, which still stands here and is today approximately five kilometers from the sea. So historically, cities that lose their economic functions disappear. Now, when we look at shrinking cities generally in the United States, some large ones in particular have in fact regained new economic functions. Universities, medical centers, technology, in cities like Baltimore, Pittsburgh, Seattle, and others have replaced historic industrial functions. But with small cities, small shrinking cities continue to decline, but they do not disappear. And so my question and the research that I've done is why don't they disappear? How had they managed to survive in the lack, the absence of new economic functions? Well, there are a number of different versions and I'll mention two of them briefly before focusing on my main theme. You have some cities that are actually strong manufacturing cities. These tend to be very small cities. They tend not to be the major ones that we think about with shrinking cities, but there are actually quite a few of them. One is Sydney, Ohio, population 21,000, where 45% of all of the jobs in the city are in manufacturing. That's significant. And it also has a median income that is higher than the national median. So this is obviously a successful small city based on manufacturing. Another very, there are however, not very many of these. Another variation is what I call well-positioned cities. You might call these lucky cities. These are cities that either by virtue of their location or by virtue of a particular asset have been able to revive significantly despite loss of their industrial base. Lowell, Massachusetts today is a suburb of Boston. It's 45 minutes by rail to downtown Boston, as well as having a fairly significant university, some tourist attractions and so forth. New Haven was fortunate that a small college that was of no particular significance during its industrial heyday has grown significantly to the point where it is now a major global institution. And between the university and the medical center, in effect is New Haven's economy and provides a pretty good economy at that. So these are again, anomalies. There are again, not so many of them. Cities simply cannot make their own luck. The luck was something that happened hundreds of years ago. So what about the rest? Here in many cities, and this is my main theme, the, and I'll, I hate to read from PowerPoint slides, but in this case, I'll make an exception. In many other cities, the historic economic base has been replaced by a system of financial transfers, which sustains a local population without regard to its level of economic activity in the conventional sense. And I call this the urban transfer payment economy. Now, what is the urban transfer payment economy? Basically, it is an economy that is based on the prop, well, before I get there, sorry. And to study this, I looked at four small shrinking cities, two in Pennsylvania, Youngstown in Ohio and Saginaw, Michigan. So what is the urban transfer payment economy? 
this should give some, some idea of how it works. Essentially, it is a function of public sector funds that are directed to the people and the institutions of the shrinking city to sustain them and provide an economy in lieu of what might be traditionally considered productive economic activity. So this chart really provides a very basic model of the, the, this economy. You have, first you have universities and community colleges as many shrinking cities, which are supported overwhelmingly by state and federal funds. You have hospitals or other kinds of medical care facilities that are supported almost entirely by Medicare and Medicaid, except for a very limited amount of private health insurance associated with various union or governmental pension plans. Finally, individual consumers in the city benefit from social security, SSI, SNAP, also known as food stamps, retirement benefits, housing vouchers, Medicaid, of course, and a variety of other federal and state financial assists. Local government is heavily de dependent, not only on significant state and federal aid, but also on taxes raised in the surrounding county. So all of these funds come into the city provide jobs, provide consumer spending, and indirect jobs. And this becomes the economy of these cities. Now, just to give an indication, if we look at, in this case, it's Johnstown, Pennsylvania, and Saginaw, Michigan. Now, clearly, in every part of the United States, there are people who receive public assistance or SNAP, SSI, which is for people on disability, housing subsidies, public sector health insurance, and so forth. But two key differences. One is that, as you can see in the chart, the percentages of people dependent on these forms of assistance are far smaller in the United States as a whole. And second, in most parts of the United States, at the same time as you have some people who benefit from these forms of assistance, you have other people who are contributing into the funds that support these forms of assistance, whether through, through taxes or other forms of earnings and support. So the upshot is that these areas, by contrast, essentially only or almost entirely receive rather than contribute. And as now, the reason I've circled this last point is that this dramatically understates the extent to which these cities are dependent on transfer payments, because if one third of all aggregate income in Johnstown, PA comes from transfer payments, but the fact is, most transfer payments do not go directly to the household, so they do not show up as this. And conservatively, I would estimate that in cities like Johnstown or Saginaw or Youngstown, roughly three quarters of the local product from an economic standpoint is a function of urban transfer payments. And as you can see, this is particularly significant with respect to children, that 80% of all children in, in this case, Youngstown and Johnstown are benefiting from Medicaid and two thirds are benefiting from SNAP. So essentially without these forms of assistance, these cities would have very little going for them. The problem, of course, is that even with these forms of assistance, they have very little going for them because the nature of the American social safety net, such as it is, is not to enable individuals and families and communities to thrive, but it is to provide a minimum level of subsistence. So when we look at indicators of social welfare, we see that the poverty rates 
especially for children, are astronomical. Few adults with a BA degree or higher live in these cities. Unemployment rates are around three times the national average. And in contrast to the United States, which has seen a small, but nonetheless more than zero increase in real household income since 1969, these cities have seen approximately a 50% drop in real household income over that period. So the upshot is that these cities are not thriving. These cities are basically simply surviving. And this chart, by the way, shows that Youngstown State University, which is the, the largest employer in the city of Youngstown, gets 80% of its operating revenues from state and federal funds, including federally guaranteed student loans. So again, it's an indication. So the question, of course, really comes up what to do. Now, the fact is all of these cities for decades have been pursuing aggressive economic development strategies in the conventional sense. Chester has this gorgeous soccer stadium by just right on the river, right next to the expressway and the bridge. Johnstown, PA has $2 billion worth of investments steered its way by former Congressman John Murtha, who was known wide and far as the King of Pork when he served in the United States House of Representatives. Youngstown has a beautiful steel mill, which was built on the site of an old steel mill. The fact is the old steel mill employed between five and 10,000 people. This steel mill employs somewhere between three and 400, most of whom need technical qualifications in order to operate various machines that have substituted for the brawn in the historic steel mill. So in effect, these cities have tried their economic development approach, every economic development approach in the United States Economic Development Playbook. And yet the upshot is that they are continuing to decline, continuing to become poorer, despite the presence of a steel mill or an airport, which somebody dubbed the airport for nobody to nowhere, and this stadium. So if these cities are not going to get out of their bind through conventional economic development strategies, and if the United States is unlikely to provide the level of social safety net needed to provide an opportunity to thrive rather than survive, what are the options? And I'll mention three very briefly, and I think this is the critical piece. The first one is to do what these cities can to reduce economic leakages and maximize the use of the dollars from transfer payments inside the city. I mean, if a, do if a doctor at the hospital is paid with Medicaid funds, but he live lives 50 miles out of town and shops elsewhere, none of his dollars are going into the city and benefiting the people in the city. So one strategy could be to try to minimize economic le leakages, to provide more opportunities and motivate people who work in the city to live, live in the city and so forth. A second, which I think is critically important, is to improve the quality of life. And you have organizations like the Youngstown Neighborhood Development Corporation, which is a spectacular group that has done amazing work for the last decade or more, improving neighborhoods, <coughs> excuse me, in Youngstown, fixing up houses, demolishing others, clearing and greening vacant lots, and making neighborhoods better places for the people in Youngstown to live. We need more of that. And then finally, I think we have to think about the human capital in these cities more focused. And 
create the kinds of educational systems, the kinds of job opportunities, perhaps even with public funds, that can enable people to live better lives and have greater skills, even if the ultimate outcome is that those people move elsewhere in order to pursue those skills. So I think those are three strategies that can be considered because I really don't believe that there are significant opportunities for conventional <clears throat> economic development for these cities. And we have to think about their future in ways that are very different. They are not going to disappear. They still have people living in them whose lives matter. They're not gonna voluntarily sort of pick up and move away from the cities that mean a great deal to them. And I think as a society, we have to recognize this and we have to come up with strategies that can enable people in these cities to live good lives and for these cities to be decent places to live, even in the absence of a conventional capitalist economic function. And I think over the coming years, as populations in the United States China and many other countries either begin to or continue to decline, this is going to be an issue that more and more cities and more and more countries are going to have to confront. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. I think that's fascinating. And you have raised many very important issues and we will come back to those issues during the discussion session. So next we will hear from our second speaker Professor Jianghui Yu. Professor Yu is Associate Fellow of the Institute of Geographic Science and Resources at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Professor Yu has been deeply engaged in the study of the transformation of China's resource-based cities and old industrial bases. He has conducted extensive evaluation research on the sustainable development of those cities and has published many journal articles and books on this topic. Professor Yi will present in Chinese, and to avoid some of the technical problems, Professor Yi has kindly recorded his presentation. I will play the recording for Professor Yi's talk, but the presentation will be translated simultaneously by our doctoral student, Wei Chan Zhou. Wei Chan is a third year doctoral student in architecture at the University of Michigan. So to hear Professor Yi's presentation in English, you will need to go to the interpretation symbol at the bottom of your screen, and then select the English channel for English translation. But Professor Yu will be joining us in our live discussion. Before I play the video, Professor Yu and Wei Chang, could you raise your hand and say hi to the audience so that they know who you are? Okay, so I'm going to play the video. I'm going to share the screen. Hello everyone, I'm Yu Jianhui. I'm from the Chinese Academy of Sciences. It's my honor to participate in today's discussion. I'd like to thank Professor Deng and his fan for organizing this event. My presentation today focuses on China's shrinking old industrial and resource cities, short for all our cities and their transformation. My trans presentation has three parts. The first part is an overview of China's OIR cities. The second part looks at the characteristics of China's shrinking OIR cities and challenges they are facing. The third part in introduces the main efforts in transforming China's shrinking OIR cities. In China, OIR city is a comprehensive concept which mainly concerns two types of cities. First is called resource cities, which are developed out of extracting and processing local natural resources, including mineral products, such as coal, iron, and copper, as well as forests. According to the national planning, China has 262 resource cities in total. The second part is uh, old industrial cities, which refers to the cities entered by heavy industry enterprises planned and built during the country's industrial development period, which is after the founding of the People's Republic of China, but before China's reform and opening up. There are 120 old industrial cities in China, which are mostly located in the Northeast and Midwest regions. 
Resource cities and old industrial cities are highly related. It is because the development of old industrial cities in the early days of the PRC referred to the idea of the Soviet Union's territorial production compact. In other words, the old industrial cities must be surrounded by sources of raw materials, i.e. origin of natural resources. Therefore, in many cases, one city can be considered as both a resource city as well as an old industrial city. After removing the duplicate value, China so far has 326 OIR cities in total, accounting for 55% of Chinese cities. In other words, more than half of the cities in China are OIR cities. China's OIR cities, of course, are in different stages of development. Some of them are growing, some of them are stable, and others are shrinking. In China, resource exhausted cities are regarded as so-called shrinking OIR cities, which refers to cities that have reached 70% of their resource extraction capacity and their natural resources will be exhausted within 10 years. These cities are representative of shrinking OIR cities, which will be our main sample group for today's discussion. Resource exhausted cities account for about 20% of OIR cities in China. Therefore, I'm going to use resource exhausted cities as typical samples to analyze China's shrinking OIR cities, their characteristics and challenges. China's shrinking OIR cities have two main characteristics. First is the large population. At the municipal district level, the average population for China's shrinking OIR cities is 840,000. Six of them have a population of over 1 million, and 13 of them have a population of over half a million. The large population base brings heavy burdens, but on the other hand, it offers great potential for cities' transformation. The second characteristic is that um, the resource extraction and related heavy industries in shrinking wire cities account for more than 50% of their economic activity. There is a very high degree of industrial concentration in wire cities. Looking at challenges faced by shrinking OIR cities, the majority of them have a long history of resource extraction, but their mineral reserves right now can only retain less than 10 years of extraction. In some of the shrinking OIR cities, resources have been depleted already. Therefore, the depletion of resources has led to significant declines in the city's key industries, and thus their economic development has slowed down dramatically. For example, our data has shown that by the end of 2009, mineral reserves in Xinjiang City could be exhausted within 10 years. Petroleum reserve in Xinjiang City could only last for eight years. Petroleum reserve in Yumen City could only last for 15 years. Copper reserve in Baiyin City can only meet 5% of its melting capacity, and the mineral resources in Gezhou City has been extracted 95%, only 5% left unworked. The declines in the city's key industries have led to a large-scale unemployment problem. This table shows that the unemployment rate in shrinking wire cities reached 12% in 2009, far higher than the national average level, especially coal cities, metallurgical cities, and forest cities. Their unemployment rates range from 13 to 15%. It should be noted that these numbers are official data, while the actual unemployment rate could be even higher than this. For example, the unemployment rate of Dongchuan District in the city of Kunming reached 30 to 40 percent at its highest level. Corresponding to the high unemployment rate, the social security coverage in shrinking OIR cities is far from sufficient. This graph shows that in 2007, the cost of basic medical insurance for urban residents in shrinking OIR cities was only about 45 percent, while the coverage of pension was just over 60 percent. Therefore, many residents who are unemployed without social security and not being covered by medical insurance and pension would make their life even harder. This situation mainly results from the government's lack of fiscal capacity. In the case of Liaoning province, which is a typical old industrial and 
resource province in 2002, it needed 1.2 billion RMB for complete social security coverage. But the local government could only raise less than 400 million RMB, which led to an 800 million financing gap. With this huge gap, the government was not able to provide social security for the unemployed. Another challenge is environmental degradation, including air and water pollution, earth sinking, and the remaining mine pits disturbing urban environment. For instance, in the city of Huai, an area of 71 square kilometers collapsed by 2010. More than 6% of the urban land in Huai Bay collapsed. Since Huai Bay has shallow surface water, 40% of the city area was filled with water. Many villages were flooded, and over 250,000 villagers lost their farmland because of the flooding, which caused serious social problems at that time. From the sinking area distribution map on the right, we can see that the central urban area of Huai Bay is in the northeast of the city, where most of the sinking areas are concentrated. Therefore, the issues of earth sinking severely uh, disturb urban development and urban life. Cheap earth facilities is another noticeable problem. This is mainly manifested in old and deteriorated residential areas with small living space per capita, security and fire hazards, and outdated public services and facilities, which leads to inconvenient transportation and other issues. Among them, Shanti Town is one of the most prominent issues. In 2009 or 2010, each shrinking, a shrinking OR city at the prefectural level contained over 1 million square meters of Shantita areas on average. 10,000 to 100,000 people live in Shantita areas per city, which indicates a large-scale issue. This photo on the left is a bird's-eye view of the Shantita area in the city of Fushun, Liaoning province. It shows a decaying Shantita before the redevelopment. The photo on the right gives us a closer look. 不是一个里面的一个细节。In this situation, local government's revenue has been declining. The key industries in the shrinking OIR cities, such as mining and related heavy industries, are declining. So the government's revenue is decreasing as well. On the other hand, local governments have to shoulder more public expenditure, including social security and environmental treatment. Therefore, local governments have limited fiscal capacity and cannot provide sufficient funding toward redevelopment. From this table, we can tell that in 2009, the ratio of spending versus revenue nationwide was 1.58, but for shrinking OIR cities, the number reached 2.25. The four cities are the highest, more than 4.6. So their fiscal capacity can only sustain the basic city operations, such as paying salaries of government employees, maintaining the operation of water pumps, roads, and other public facilities, as well as providing social security for people who have already enrolled. We call this mouth-feeding budget, which cannot support a city's transformation. So far, I have shown some issues exposed by China's OIR cities in the process of shrinking between 2000 and 2010. Chinese governments have noticed these issues and conducted experiments to find solutions. China launched the first pilot project in the city of Fuxing, and later five more cities joined the experiment. Around 2008, China identified 69 resource exhausted cities which kicked off the transformation of OIR cities in China. We can say that 2009 and 2010 was the starting point for China's OIR cities transformation. This slide shows a timeline that includes the major efforts made by the Chinese government in transforming China's OIR cities. In the 1980s, Chinese academics started a discussion of issues related to the shrinking OIR cities. The Chinese government paid attention but did not take any actions on a large scale. 
In 2001, the government defined the city of Fuxi as the first pilot city to test various economic transformation efforts. In 2005, the number of pilot cities increased. Five additional OIR cities joined the experiment. From 2008 to 2011, the Chinese government launched large-scale interventions. 69 resource exhausted cities were identified, which initiated the transformation of shrinking OIR cities on a national scale. In 2013, the Chinese government issued two national plans, National Old Industrial Cities Adjustment and Rebuilding Plan and National Resource Cities Sustainable Development Plan. They paved the road for the integrated development regarding these two types of cities. Overall, the Chinese government has made the following efforts in coping with the shrinking OIR cities and their transformation. First is the direct control and tax support. Since 2007, China's central government has set up fiscal transfer payments to provide ongoing direct financial support to identified resource exhausted cities. So far, the central government has transferred more than 160 billion RMB to OIR cities and, their, and the number is still growing. This fund is allocated based on the city's population size. The money is directly transferred to the local treasury department. Ways of using this money are relatively flexible. The central government only provides general recommendations. For example, it would recommend using this money to build new industrial platforms, cover the gap in social security assistance, improve residents' living environments, or require, re repair ecological environments. But it does not uh, specify or restrict ways of using this fund, which gives local governments flexibility in using this fund to support the city's transformation. Usually, the central government has strict requirements for local governments regarding funds allocation. Most of the funds should be used exclusively for certain purposes, and the money would be transferred directly to a bank account specific to certain projects. However, fiscal transfer payments for resource exhausted cities are relatively flexible, which shows great support for these cities and their transformation. Moreover, for some OIR cities, the amount of the transfer payments they receive every year may be equal to their annual revenue, which means that their fiscal revenue has been doubled. On the other hand, the central government also provides tax support for resource cities. The resource tax contributes to the majority of their fiscal revenue, which is yearly shared with the central government. However, the tax policy support allows local governments to retain all resource uh, tax which makes local revenue increase at least 10%. Therefore, this direct fiscal and tax support greatly enhances the physical capacity, capacity of the shrinking OIR cities. The second effort is made through targeted projects to tackle specific challenges in their transformation. One project is fostering continued and substitute industries. The central government has allocated over 20 billion RMB to support local enterprises and projects that are labor, labor intensive or recycling resources and to solve the issues of unemployment, waste of resources, or pollution. The second project aims to improve residents' living environments by redeveloping shanty town in OIR cities through favorable policies in land supply and tax exemptions. On average, over 3 million square meters of shanty town areas have been redeveloped in each OIR city, improving the living conditions for 100,000 residents per city. We can say that this effort is very effective. In the effort of Environment, environmental treatment, comprehensive treatment projects were launched to repair the environmental damages caused by resource extraction. The central government has funded over 100 projects, which means over 100 regions have been involved and treated. Such projects would last a long period because the land restoration needs five, six, or even ten years. 
Another effort targets, targeted redeveloping special areas, which mostly refers to independent industrial and mining areas that are remotely located far away from the city center and having little development prospects. The effort was made to relocate settlements in these areas and redevelop the sites back into their natural landscape. Over 100 special, special areas have been redeveloped so far. An example at the bottom is Keke Tuohai Independent Industrial and Mining Area. It is located 50 kilometers away from the county center. In its most prosperous time, the population of this area reached 80,000. But because of the depletion of mineral resources, its whole population has been reduced to 86,000. The mine pits were redeveloped into a national geological park, and the whole area was redeveloped into a tourist attraction to boost the local tourism industry. Besides these targeted approaches mentioned above, major national investment projects started to prioritize drinking water cities to help their transformation. For example, some OIR cities are located on the route of China's south-north water diversion project. They can use the project investment to help relocate settlements in the Shanti Town areas. Because the project itself needs to relocate some settlements to make space for the water course. Therefore, we plan the water course going through the Shantytown areas on purpose so that we can kill two birds with one stone. We carry out the project on the one hand, and on the other hand, we relocate the settlements in Shantytown. In addition, national and provincial government funding towards environmental treatment and industrial cluster development will prioritize resource exhausted cities. Meanwhile, priority and enhanced support would be also given to projects applied by resource-exhausted cities. Over 10 years have passed since China started the transformation of drinking water cities. Looking back, the transformation has made several achievements in the following aspects. First, the large unemployment problem has disappeared. Right now, the unemployment rate in shrinking wire cities is only 5 or 4 or 5 percent, basically equal to the national level. Local economics are uh, less reliant on resource extraction or related industries. The degree of the dependence has decreased from 50 percent to less than 10 percent. The coverage rate of Social Security has increased from about 40% to over 90%. Many cities even reached 99%. All large-scale shantytown areas have been redeveloped. Right now, we can hardly see any large settlements with poor living conditions. Furthermore, there is no significant population loss in this process. According to the statistical data, between 1895 and 2018, we observed population loss in about one-third of shrinking OIR cities, but the loss was less than 10% for most of them. This is quite ideal, relatively speaking. This is my presentation on China's ranking OIR cities, their transformation and efforts made by Chinese government. Thank you for listening. Any questions are welcome. Sorry. Thank you for a very comprehensive review of the both the challenges and, and the efforts that have been made in transforming China's you know, resource and old industrial city. Thank, thanks to Professor Yu, and also thanks to Wichan for the excellent translation. So next we will, our third speaker will be Professor Yin Nong. Professor Long is a research professor in the School of Architecture at Tsinghua University. His research focuses on urban science, including applied urban modeling, big data analytics and visualization, and the planning support system. Professor Long's academic studies creatively integrate international method and experience with local planning practice. Before joining Tsinghua University, Professor Long has worked for Beijing Institute of City Planning as a senior planner for 11 years. 
Professor Long is also the founder of Beijing City Lab, an open research network for quantitative urban studies. Professor Long, please. Okay, thank you, Professor Deng, for your introduction. And uh, please allow me share my screen. And uh, it is my great honor to be here to share our, I think, very preliminary advance for, uh, for shrinking cities in China. And today I'd like to, to introduce uh, our uh, design workshop, urban design workshop conducted in, uh, I think, two years ago in Hegang city, I think the so-called Rust Belt in, in China. And uh, so actually, uh, since the shrinking cities are our topic today for the Sino USA and uh, uh, so-called webinar, and I think shrinking cities are always associated with uh, some problems like population loss, uh, unemployment, urban vacancies, space disorder. So actually my, my lab and my collaborators in, uh, um, I mean, uh, have been working on understanding uh, shrinking cities in China for uh, in the past uh, several years. Uh, so actually, uh, uh, on the right, uh, we are. I, I like to show the comparison between uh, the. Uh, I mean, for the population census conducted in two thousand and two thousand and ten. Actually, uh, from the comparison uh, for the population, we have identified around one hundred and eighty cities are losing or losing population in the past 10 years. I, I mean, during 10, uh, 2002, 2010. So anyway, uh, I think that uh, that was the first time for us uh, to identify shrinking cities in China. And right now, actually, we have, I mean, the central government in China has released the new population census, I mean, in 2000, uh, in 2020. And uh, uh, my lab is uh, still working on, uh, on similar, conducting similar work. Actually, uh, in, I think in the recent past 10 years, I mean, shrinking cities still exist on the territory of China, and the pattern is a bit different from this one. Actually, we also have the opportunity to understand uh, how many shrinking cities in each country in the world, I mean, on the planet. Uh, recently, we have published one paper in Environment and Planning A by my postdoc. Uh, and uh, we are referring to the uniform, I mean, so-called definition for, for cities in different countries. Uh, I mean, uh, we like to use the term like uh, spatial cities. I mean, from this way, we are able to identify shrinking city numbers, I mean, total numbers in each country. And uh, here, uh, uh, we found uh, China is among the, the, I mean, ranking the first uh, in the world in terms of the shrinking city uh, total number, followed by the United States. I think that is why we are here for for Sino, uh, uh, Sino USA uh, webinar. I think that is very important, and our research and other collaborator uh, from from my lab and uh, other collabor collaborators in China have received attention from the central government in China. For example, uh, the, the so-called NDRC uh, uh, actually released one, uh, one, one, one uh, government policy in 2019. And uh, uh, the document recognized the existence of shrinking cities in the, in the country, I think for the first time. Actually, how to combine, how to how to cope with the shrinking cities in China? Actually, uh, I think in the literature there are two ways. First is to we should try to revitalize the shrinking cities. The other way is we admit the existence of shrinking cities and uh, we put more uh, more and more efforts on improving the quality of life in the shrinking cities. Actually, uh, when we are talking about the urban development in uh, in Chinese city, I think we urban planning is playing a very important role. Actually, several years ago, Professor Wu Fulong from UCL published one 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 uh one book entitled "Planning for Growth." I think in the past several 
decades. I mean, the urban development in China is always, of, of, I think, by, by default, it is for, for growth. So, so anyway, I think uh, shrinking cities in China, uh, although the government, uh, the government, central government admit the existence of shrinking cities, uh, shrinking cities. Uh, however, uh, shrinking cities, uh, I mean, is a new term to <laughs> urban planning background student and urban planners in China. So that is why we conducted, we initiated the urban design workshop two years ago in Hegang, I think it's in uh, northeastern uh, uh, China and uh, bordering uh, Russia. And uh, here is the, 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 uh, the Hegang municipal region. And we are, uh, central, we are looking at the central city for Hegang. I think Hegang is also a resource city. I mean, by coal, coal. And uh, I think in the past, uh, uh, Hegang is prosperous in coal also trapped in coal, actually, since, uh, I mean, uh, uh, coal is gone, uh, almost gone, I think, in the past several, uh, uh, in the past several years. And, uh, uh, and the losing population in the past 10 years, uh, and also revealed by the new population sensors, uh, I mean, and also there are a lot of urban vacancies, like the vacant land and also abandoned buildings. And in some places in Hegang, the spatial quality for public space is also very low. And, uh, and then uh, environmental pollution as well, and also ecolo ecological dis destruction. Uh, so that is Hegang. And I think uh, our workshop for urban design is the first one in the country, <laughs> I mean, uh, 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 to, to discuss how to deal with shrinking cities in China. And we are regarding Hegang as an example to do that. And our workshop is also sponsored, was also sponsored by, by our research network for Chinese shrinking cities and also by Urban Planning Society in China, Academy of China, and also by Hegang municipal government. Yeah, we, are, we were very lucky to, to receive uh, I mean, support from local government and also from the local design uh, agency like uh, Heilongjiang uh, Province Urban Planning Association and also the, uh, the, the Institute. I think that is, uh, was the first one in the country and we are just uh, trying to push forward a little bit and I mean to advance uh, the, the, the spatial intervention for shrinking cities in China. And actually our design theme is smart shrink, shrinkage and also while well, keeping the quality development. And in our design, we have two levels. First one is the overall urban design, like the conceptual urban design or the comprehensive urban design, followed by, by zooming into the central city, like the uh, district urban design I and mean detailed design. And uh, two years ago, we initiated the uh, the urban design workshop, and we release the information, and we call for participants, and uh, and uh, I think in total, just the workshop, uh, I mean, is uh, spanning several months, uh, and uh, and and actually, um, we after selection, we have selected uh, thirteen teams from nine universities in the workshop, like Tsinghua University, my home, my, home, uh, my home university as well, and HIT as well as Northeast Forest University in Heilongjiang province where Hegang is, and Chongqing University and also uh, other ones. So I think it is a large team and our group photo, uh, I mean, during our site survey in Hegang, which uh, I mean, we, we conducted a five day on-site field survey to Hegang while students and mentors, I mean, were working together for preparing the urban design for, for the city of Hegang. And uh, I like to show some visual pictures uh, for, uh, I mean, during our set survey, for example, the main, the main piece as well. I mean, there is a vast area for a main piece, I mean, uh, and also vacant lots or vacant uh, blocks. I mean, 
uh, also uh, Hegang also has some shanty towns. Uh, most of them uh, have been demolished actually, like Professor Yu has mentioned. And then there were still some shanty towns as well in the, city, in the central city of Hegang. And uh, abandoned buildings were not rare in the city. So here are the pictures. Also the senior residents, for example, we visited the, the children park. However, <laughs> we, we witnessed a lot of senior people there. So that was very tricky to me and to other students as well. And I think since the local government of Hegang has demolished a lot of shanty towns, I mean the poor quality housings in the central city of Hegang, they demolished, however, there were not many commercial development opportunities in the city. So they were adopting the green infrastructure strategy already, I think. Vast land for, for open space, like the, uh, like the Sprout Park. Also the Linear Park, for example, also uh, the, the, the Wild Park, also, uh, so anyway, in, I think in when we were conducting uh, urban design workshop in Hega, we I saw a lot of green lands. I mean, newly built green lands transformed by shanty towns, and the local government like that since they do not need pay a lot of money to sustain the the land, for example, uh, and also the local residents also like that. And from the literature, green infrastructure is also a very important strategy to deal with a uh, uh, shrinking city, like in the United States. I mean, I, uh, I also had the opportunity to, to visit the Rust Belt in the United States. I think two years ago with uh, Professor Gao Shuti from, uh, from uh, Southeast University. Uh, we had a very good experience down there. And we also uh, how uh, we also saw some uh, I mean, green infrastructure projects and the developments. However, in Hegang, I mean, the size, the scale is, I mean, larger, quite larger, comparing to, to the counterparts in the United States. And uh, let me see, and we also uh, conducted, I mean, uh, I mean, the teams also conducted the site analysis since to understand the site is very important. For example, housing vacancy identification to understand how about the housing vacancy situation in the central city of Hegang. Since, uh, for example, the dominant residential, uh, residential buildings or houses are quite different from the United States. For example, here, the density is higher, and the total floor number is around six, uh, five to, to seven. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, quite different from the detached or semi-detached houses in the United States. So, I mean, the building form reminded me, I mean, to deal with housing vacancies is quite difficult comparing uh, to the counterpart in the United States. Since you can imagine for for the building, residential building, I mean, the housing vacancy is around, for example, is uh, half half, for example, the 50%. How to deal with it? How to deal with that? It is much difficult. Yeah, since the, I mean, the form is different. And also the, we are, we are also trying to understand the spatial quality, like from the view of spatial disorder, we also conducted some uh, urban sensing, uh, we, we employed, uh, the urban sensing technique to, to sense the whole central area and also the human activities as well. And I'd like to bri uh, briefly introduce the, the design strategies from the over 10 teams from the nine universities. Uh, we have, uh, we are trying, we, I am trying to summarize what uh, I mean the teams uh, uh, are doing during the, I mean, during the design or the, from uh, the review for the design. For example, the, uh, the general design strategy is including three stages. First is to downsize, to clean up the vacant land, for example, abandoned building. That is uh, to, to, to do the very basic spatial intervention for shrinking city, followed by recover, for example, the ecological restoration and the community of placemaking from the social dimension. The last one is maybe, maybe 
some part of the city has the opportunity for development or urban redevelopment. Uh, for to, for example, to welcome some opportunities uh, like economy and social. Uh, so uh, that are the three stages. And here are some 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 pictures from the teams like application of urban repair or ecological restoration in shrinking cities from the design work number six and uh, yeah number six as well. And uh, other, uh, for example, in integration of shanty town reconstruct uh, construction and the environmental improvement in demolished resettlement areas, I think also from the, uh, from other uh, other group as well. And also, uh, Hegang, uh, Hegang also has some uh, historic space. I mean, so some students were integrating the historic space intervention and the placemaking based on the some 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 quantitative analysis. So we also conducted the, the final review for the design uh, workshop in the last day. And we uh, invited some professors in Heilongjiang and from Beijing as well, my colleague, uh, Professor Zhongge, and also the head of the uh, Heilongjiang uh, Urban Planning Design, uh, uh, Urban Planning uh, Urban Planning Institute, and, and also the Hegang Urban Design Institute. And the, uh, anyway, I think professors and professionals liked the student's design, since I think that is the first one in the country, in the PRC. So I also appreciated a lot uh, from, uh, for students' work from so many universities and so many teams. And uh, after that, we also, uh, we also, uh, uh, we, uh, we also publicized some awards uh, to, 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 to some leading teams in, uh, in the afterward. Uh, uh, China Shrinking City Symposium uh, in Harbin. Uh, I mean, just I think two days later after our final review. So anyway, to conclude, I think, uh, I, uh, I mean, I, as what we, I have mentioned, I think downsizing, recover, development, maybe one, 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 one plausible and possible uh, way to deal with urban design and urban planning in shrinking cities in China. And we are still, I think that is a very preliminary experiment in the country. Uh, I, in the country. And uh, my lab is still in collaboration with uh, Heilongjiang Urban Planning Institute and working in Hegang and in Heihe as well. And uh, both of them are shrinking cities. I think uh, we are on the way. Yeah, not finished yet. Yeah, thank you so much for your attention. Yeah, thank for, uh, you. yeah Professor. Yeah, Professor. Thank you. yeah, your wonderful talk. I think it's it's good to see that there has been growing attention to the issue of shrinking cities, and your talk highlights some of the similarities and differences in, in the challenges the cities face. So next, we will turn to Professor Brent Ryan. Professor Ryan is head of the City Design and Development Group and Associate Professor of Urban Design and Public Policy in MIT. Professor Ryan's research focuses on the aesthetics and the policies of contemporary urban design, particularly with, re with respect to pressing issues like deindustrialization and climate change. Professor Ryan conducts urban design research and practice across the world, including China, Ukraine, Russia, India, and the United States. So now I will let Professor Ryan talk. Thank you, Professor Den. I really appreciate the invitation to speak here tonight. I also appreciate the invitation to come after three very knowledgeable and talented speakers, um, two of whom I've had the pleasure of working with in the past. So it's wonderful to be joining all of you here tonight. And I will uh, now uh, share my screen uh, if it's if it's allowing me to, just one moment. Are we seeing? Um... No, you're sharing the wrong file. You're sharing the agenda. Oh, I'm sharing the agenda. My apologies. That's OK. Let me close that. How's that looking? A little better? That's good. <clears throat> Excellent. Uh, my talk, the conclusory one of tonight's session, is entitled 
what do US and Chinese shrinking cities have to learn from each other? Reflections on comparative teaching and research. And before I begin, I've placed an asterisk by shrinking because the term shrinking, although it's recognized globally, is not always recognized locally. In the United States, many shrinking cities are referred to as legacy cities, as Alan Malik is familiar with, because the term shrinking is often politically sensitive and seen as negative within the American growth-oriented context. And uh, many Chinese shrinking cities are called transitional cities, because I think, as Dr. Yu pointed out, these cities are part of a larger group of deindustrializing cities that may not all be shrinking, but they are in a process of economic transition, each and every one of them, whether they're losing population or not. So let me first discuss a bit of the context that allows me to provide this comparative perspective um, at the end of tonight's session. Um, I've been a part since uh, 2019 of a 35-year collaboration between Tsinghua University and MIT that has offered urban design studios. Um, starting at a very formative period of China's growth, we were fortunate to receive an endowment back at that time that's provided consistent institutional support for this collaboration. Interestingly, in 2019, Professor Lu Jian, who you can see with the pink scarf, and Professor Tang Yan to her right, um, suggested that we focus instead on the old industrial city of Tangshan, rather than on the previous themes for these urban design studios, which were rapidly growing cities like Beijing that were at risk of losing heritage, or rapidly growing cities like Zhengzhou that were attempting to move toward ecological civilization. So we shifted the theme of the studio to uh, cities in transition and Tangshan was the first city Red, in, in the Red. series of studios. Yes. Slides are not advancing. Um, are you looking at the city in transition slide? No, it's still on the first slide. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Maybe you, you go to full screen. It doesn't seem to be on full screen. So um, bring your shared window to the front. I've never had this problem in Zoom before. Um, let me see how I do that. Um, sorry for this technical problem. I've never had this problem of how about having to bring a shared window to the front before. And I, I don't see instructions in Zoom as to how to do that exactly. Maybe you could exit and re-sharing. Yes, I'll try that. That's which slide are we, which slide are we seeing now? Picture, the picture of the, the studio. Okay, so, and is it advancing now? It is. Okay, so that, that was a Zoom bug, apologies for that. So here you're seeing a photograph of the 2019 Tangshan Studio, and uh, as well as a cover of the studio book, which was recently published on Issue. And if you go to the link provided there, you can get an access online, a free copy of that studio book. A bit of context of Tangshan. Tangshan is a paradigmatic old industrial city that's suffering from resource extraction. I'd be interested in the statistics of as to how many of Tangshan's resources have been extracted. My sense is most of them, and it's experiencing a lot of um, subsidence from land mining. Of course, Tangshan is also a Phoenix city that suffered from a tremendous earthquake in 1976. So Tangshan has been simultaneously rebuilt just in time for its industry, its industrial economy to have reached its peak. Here's an example of some of the industrial fabric of Tangshan that was part of the subject of our urban design studio. Uh, the Tang steel plant, which we can see pre-earthquake at left and at right, um, just before it closed, it's actually a very recently reconstructed and renovated steel plant that's moved to the South Fadian area by the ocean. So Tangshan has a number of large industrial facilities that are in the process of becoming vacant leaving, in essence, what we would call in the United States, very large brownfields. 
these sites formed the subject for our urban design study. And just to provide one example of some of the ideas that students provided for the now vacant Tong steel plant, um, there was a concept of first using um, land that was um, considered polluted um, for terraforming and then reforesting, regenerating the economy, and then creating new economic uses sort of akin to what many of us have been speaking about an attempt to retool the economy of the city, in this case for um, high technology uses. Another context of the reflections that I'm offering come from empirical planning research on Chinese shrinking cities, in this case, Yichun. And I conducted this research with Professor Gao Shuqi of Southeast University, looking at Yichun, a paradigmatic shrinking city, in this case, a, a resource extraction city. Um, I visited Yichun as well in 2019 with Professor Ing Wong. And as part of this study, we had the opportunity to look at shantytown redevelopment to, and to assess how successful this policy was within the context of a single city. Here we see it left shanties that are in the process of demolition. These houses will be gone by this point. And some of the recently constructed housing, we saw other examples of that tonight, for residents of the shanties. This, of course, was built at great expense by uh, city officials as part of the large amounts of transferred funds that uh, Dr. Yu was speaking about earlier. What we see, of course, and I think this was also found in the city that Ing Long was looking at, is that a lot of this housing is in fact vacant. So now multifamily housing has scattered vacancies because the residents have decided to move to areas with better economies. They're simply unable to find economic life for themselves in each end. So the problem has been shifted to a different kind of housing, but the problem of vacancy remains. And I've been fortunate to conduct a lot of research on American shrinking cities, beginning, of course, with the city of Detroit that formed some of the uh, source of my early shrinking city research, and more recently, the city of Youngstown that Alan Malik also spoke about. Shuchi Gao from Southeast University and I have collaborated in several studies of Youngstown, and we continue to collaborate in these studies. One such study examined the challenges of plan implementation in Youngstown. This is an example of right sizing, where a city is attempting to bring itself into conformance with its new uh, reduced state. And Youngstown is a city, uh, if you're familiar with the American shrinking city context, that's composed mainly of single family homes, many of which have been demolished. The city's population has dropped substantially to the extent that even some infrastructure has begun to be closed. In this case, it's a street that's been permanently closed because there are no houses remaining on the street. This is a phenomenon that's as yet quite rare in the American city, but that I think will grow in the coming decades as cities attempt to sustain themselves economically with very, very few houses remaining on their urban blocks. Youngstown in 2005 put forth a very, very aspirational land use plan in our research, which was published in the Journal of the American Planning Association examined how able Youngstown was to actually realize this aspirational land use plan in its 2013 zoning. And we found that due to political, social, and economic factors, most of the aspirational land use plan was not realized. So in fact, it's extremely challenging both at the planning and at the housing redevelopment level to confront the widespread shrinkage that's happening in American shrinking cities. Let me move on to five reflections that I'd like to conclude with tonight that come from my experience that I've been fortunate to have in both Chinese and American shrinking cities. First, I wanna focus on the people that live in these cities. I think this is really where we have to center our efforts as urban planners in making sure that we ameliorate the challenges that residents face to the maximum extent possible. And it's very clear that probably the most important shared feature of American and Chinese shrinking cities is that the residents of these cities face substantial hardships and have very, very difficult lives. This is really what struck me uh, dominantly in both places. In Ichun, for example, the residents are quite poor and they're poorly housed. At the same time, they face additional challenges that their incomes are sometimes so low that they're unable to afford resettlement housing. And I think equally important, 
that the physical determinism of building new housing doesn't necessarily solve the residents' other issues, as the United States found, in fact, in its public housing experiment of the 1950s and 1960s. Their economic and social needs remained, and these needs are not necessarily met by resettlement. Thus, we see the vacant or half-vacant multifamily buildings of the city of Ichun. Youngstown residents are also poor and are also poorly housed, but they exist within a political economy that's no longer dedicated to large scale um, reconstruction of housing. The United States has passed that era. The, housing con the new housing construction that occurs in Youngstown, as, um, as Alan spoke about, is in fact residual due to the small amounts of federal funding that are dedicated to that task. And so Youngstown residents are in essence poorly housed and obliged to remain in that housing as they have few resettlement options within the existing city. Or they, like Ichun residents, can leave the city entirely, often moving to suburban areas, which in essence drains the city of economic activity, which is also something that Alan spoke about tonight, uh, leading to fiscal problems for those cities. A second reflection has to do with the built environment. I'm a built environment scholar, as are others of us here, and the built environment remains uh, a major policy and design focus in shrinking cities. Why is that? And one reason is because the abandoned properties of these cities are so visible that they lead to uh, a negative image for the city. It's inescapably a dominant feature of the urban experience of American shrinking cities that one sees abandoned land um, and abandoned housing. Formerly, of course, one also saw more abandoned commercial and industrial space. But it, it, for example, in Youngstown, most of this industrial space has been demolished. You don't see abandoned factories necessarily anymore, but you still see abandoned housing. So in both Chinese and American shrinking cities, I find it very interesting that housing is a nexus for policy and design efforts. And I think this is an opportunity for a lot of shared collaboration and insights um, between scholars and practitioners that are interested in housing issues. I have not seen the same amount of attention paid to industry as a, as a feature of the built environment in the United States. Um, my experience of these remaining facilities is that they're spectacular and culturally significant, especially to the people who used to work in them or experience them on a daily basis. For example, the Johnstown um, Steelworks in uh, Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Um, however, most of these sites have been demolished because of the political economy of the United States, where um, new economic development is seen as an important priority. Um, they have received more attention in China, and I think there's an opportunity in China for some of these industrial sites to be salvaged for cultural purposes, as is happening in the Shogong site west of Beijing that's been repurposed um, for the Winter Olympics that I believe are coming um, in 2022, if I'm not mistaken. So the built environment remains a nexus of, of focus in both countries, but there are some differences in the amount of attention paid to industrial properties. Third reflection has to do with the politics of countries. Uh, the political situations of both China and the US, of course, are a great deal of interest to people in both countries. You could describe China's political system as a top-down system where a lot of decisions are made at central government levels and both decisions and resources flow down to uh, lower levels of government. The United States, um, although people's impression is that it may seem top down is, is actually quite often a bottom up country where municipalities are politically independent of their regions. Municipalities are also independent in terms of the policies that they can generate. It's an opportunity for innovation. I found when comparing the United States and China that there's no clear winner of top down or bottom up politics. Both have their advantages and both have their disadvantages. For example, in Ichun, city officials have significant power and resources. They have the resources, or at least some of the resources, to rehouse large numbers of residents of the city. And they have residents who are, in fact, mostly willing to be rehoused without making too much of a fuss. At the same time, these city officials, as uh, Dr. Yu alluded to, are faced with directives 
that come from the national or provincial levels that might not be a, might not be funded or achievable in a full sense. We have a term in the United States of the unfunded mandate, and I think unfunded or, or partially funded mandates are extremely common in China. In Youngstown, you don't have a lot of mandates coming from the federal government. You have some weak resources coming from a variety of uh, ways, uh, as, as Alan Malik spoke about. So you have less power in that sense because you have fewer resources at hand. You also have a very, very active civil society that often actively resists the interference of government in their lives, as we see from the United States is very unsuccessful COVID vaccination campaign, which is now leading to additional problems in the United States. So Youngstown officials have fewer mandates, but they do have an active um, civil society. As a result, they struggle to achieve substantial action. I think the appearance of American shrinking cities is that it looks like a place where not much is happening. That in fact is true. There's not a lot of things happening except at the community level through um, organizations like community development corporations and inclusive and equitable decision-making despite a long American tradition of dedication to that tradition is only partially successful. There was a study published recently that said, despite holding about a thousand meetings for the Detroit um, general plan of 2012, the authors felt that the plan did not have enough substantial public participation. So that's an ongoing challenge. Speaking a little bit more about participatory planning, this is perhaps the most dearly held value of urban planning theorists globally. And yet participatory planning is a challenge in shrinking cities in both the United States and China. Of course, in cities like Ichun, residents are not really offered the option to participate in many of the decisions that are affecting their lives. And many of their preferences, as we found when we looked at a reference, uh, we looked at interviewing residents, their preferences are often ignored. Actually, a surprising number of Ichun residents would have preferred to have stayed in their housing. They liked having the house that they did. They would have preferred that it be rehabilitated rather than moved, but they didn't have that option to participate. In a city like Youngstown, residents are offered a lot of opportunities to participate. The city is sincerely dedicated to participatory planning, as are the many community organizations in Youngstown. But through that participatory planning, achieving meaningful consensus is difficult. Therefore, there was very little consensus politically that the Youngstown general plan that I talked about earlier should be actually transformed into zoning because people felt that it would affect their property in a negative way. Achieving consensus was really challenging. And sustaining participatory processes, the processes are great. They do involve residents. This is a study that uh, Professor Gal and I are working on right now, looking at participation. But sustaining these participatory processes is extremely costly. It literally requires money to keep financing participatory processes that engage residents. And of course, participation tends to drop off after time. Lastly, I'd like to reflect on um, something we may all be thinking about, which is why is there so little comparative research on US and Chinese shrinking cities? Well, I place the aster asterisk again, because in the first place, these cities may be conceived of as slightly differently. Uh, many cities that will perhaps be shrinking in the future in China are still being thought of economically um, as declining industrial cities. In the United States, these cities are be th being thought of as legacy cities because the social sustainability of these cities is so important. So maybe some of it is in the way that we conceive of these cities. But I'd like to add a couple of additional reflections. If you move beyond big data studies, it gets actually quite challenging to compare United States and Chinese shrinking cities. Case study research, as Professor Gao and I have found, can be quite a challenge um, in China due to data accessibility as well as political concerns. And we've even had problems in the United States in terms of accessing information from American shrinking cities um, because sometimes uh, community organizations are sensitive about the way in which their efforts are going to be perceived. So there are political sensitivities in both countries having to do with the efforts that are being undertaken wanting to be perceived as successful. Planning scholars who are not necessarily in a position to always be supporting those efforts or demonstrating that they're successful might run into problems if their research is seen as being a critique of those efforts. 
of course, linguistic and cultural barriers, as well as a lack of resources on both sides are a challenge. And I really call upon foundations in the United States to engage in more comparative um, financing of research. Foundations in the United States are so often only interested in their own cities that they don't finance comparative research. I've been very lucky at MIT to have a university that supports comparative, um, comparative research, and I believe the University of Michigan is also one of those places. And lastly, the distinctions between US and Chinese shrinking cities may make some comparative, potentially comparative researchers think that they're not interested in comparative research. For example, the focus in the United States right now on racial justice and racial segregation, to my mind, makes comparative research with China where racial justice and racial segregation is not so much of a focus, it's a much more homogenous population, it makes comparative research seem less important. But my conviction is that comparative research is critical for gaining perspectives on the problems and the potential resolutions to both uh, cities, shrinking cities in the United States and in China. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Ryan, for such a thoughtful presentation. I think that really helps bring everything together for all these talks. And I'm completely with you that there is such an urgent need for comparative research. And it's not just in the Shinkin city area, but also in many other areas as well. You know, direct comparison between China and US and how can each of them learn from each other. So I think that's I think that's a great point. So yeah, we now we can move to to address the audience questions. But before I take the audience question, I would just like to use my own privilege as a moderator to, to ask a question. And I think in both like Alan's talk and Brain's talk, and both of you kind of focus a lot on like helping people, right? So helping people is extremely important. And, and especially in, in the context of, you know, some places may not be able to offer many opportunities. So, but I, I think I would like to also to, to know a little bit more on the China side. I think you know, I'm sure in, in the Chinese government has also encountered a similar issue with regard to help people versus help place. And Professor Yu in his talk, he mentioned about you know, the, the Chinese government efforts of relocating residents from away from some of the small shrinking cities that do not have like, do not have much development prospects. So perhaps this is a question for Professor Yu. Maybe you can explain more. <coughs> Sorry. Excuse me. Maybe, maybe you can <clears throat> explain <clears throat> a little bit more about, sorry, about some of the <clears throat> efforts of helping people like moving to those places, those, <clears throat> those assistance. Settlement Bishan 这是一个搬迁的方式
，另外的城市能够让他们很好的搬迁，能够住到很好的地方去的话，必须要解决他们的经济问题。所以说，对于配套的这个就业的辅助，来促进他这个搬迁是非常重要的。所以基本上我们总结了有三个方向去，呃，促进当地搬迁居民的这个就业，来让他能够有钱去支付这个搬迁的费用，或者说是搬迁的住的更好。有三个方式，一个是提供这个免费的再就业培训，另外一个呢是引进当地的这个企业，基本上政府会跟他们签协议，就是要按比例吸纳这个搬迁居民。你必须招工的时候要吸纳百分之十或者百分之二十的这个搬迁的居民在你的企业里面工作。另外一个是政府，基本上我知道的资源枯竭城市，它政府开发的公益性岗位大量的都是面向这一类居民去就业，让他们招招招聘他们去就业的。这是三个主要的方式。另外，在这个搬迁地，基本上是按照这个新区来进行这个公共服务设施的配建，这是一个对，呃，整个搬迁地域的一个公共设施的一个支持。大概的整个搬迁政策就是这么一个情况。Okay, so right now it's for me to translate. Uh, so there are two types of relocation in resource exhausted cities. The first one is called emergency relocation. Residents were relocated because their homes were damaged due to the earth sinking. This happened mostly in the independent industrial and mining areas that are remotely located, far away from the city center. And in this case, am I muted? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. Um, in this case, the whole settlement or the whole village would be relocated. Um, the second type of relocation is related to the shantytown redevelopment. This involved urban residents, mainly those who worked for the lo local mining and related industries. Um, Ms. Fan, can you hear me? Uh, there was a break. Okay. Um, so the, this, um, Shanti Town relocation. I think the translating channel is not working. Something's wrong. Uh, Ms. Fan, can you hear me? Very interrupted. Okay. So can, can we make Wei Chan just a panelist rather than a translator? Th that was fine. Your last statement was clear. Okay. You, you can all hear me right now, yeah. right? Right now. Okay. So um, where, I, where am I? The, the uh, the that's fine. Okay, yeah. fine. I think I got all of it. Uh, so the Shantytown relocation used to take different approaches, but uh, nowadays it also takes. We have ten more minutes. How about we ask a few more questions to the other panelists? Um, Bro broke again. No, it's uh, Miss Ban interrupted. She she mentioned something. She's asking whether we need to move on. Yeah, you can just yeah. I think we can. You can just keep going. Yeah, you are okay. Okay, so these two types of relocation are basically using the same approach right now from the perspective of the moving cost. Uh, the central government, local governments, and the residents each would pay one third of the cost. Uh, in cities where the local governments have a high fiscal capacity, the residents may bear lower cost. Um, in the beginning, when the substitute industries had not been fostered yet, the local governments and the residents were poor. So the relocation could meet with resistance. Um, as the emerging industries strengthening the local economy, uh, there would be less resistance. Um, the local governments would have uh, la would have less financial stress, and the cost is still split equally between the central government, local governments, and the residents. Um, after the relocation, the resettlements can receive a large number of subsidies from the governments to develop public facilities and services, including new schools and hospitals. Um, on the other hand, the relocated residents were provided with free uh, re-employment training 
um, the newly introduced enterprises would need to sign an agreement which stip stipulates that they would hire a certain percentage of the re relocated uh, residents, like 20%. Um, in addition, government created what we called uh, public welfare positions, um, such as the security guards and janitors for the government. Um, these jobs are mostly offered to the relocated residents. It, it helps to uh, solve the unemployment problem among the relocated residents. Um, that's it. Very nice, Wei Tan. So I saw Tang raised his hand. So Tang, do you have a question? Uh, yes, this is purely a logistics question, and I probably should have raised it in the uh, pre-session. Um, I think a lot of us are hearing some interesting people where we feel that we may actually be able to uh, make a contribution to their work or, or have a discussion. Is there any sort of way, and again, this may also be addressed to uh, uh, Min and, and myself, is there a way that we can have a little bit of a sort of a crossroads where we can um, w without necessarily violating anyone's privacy, uh, make connections with people we've we've heard. I was able to do one directly through the uh, chat uh, panel with uh, um, Professor uh, Ryan, but I think there's some other people where um, sometimes after these, particularly where there are a number of different experts in this particular area, uh, it sort of begs roundtables or uh, you know direct connections. So. I, again, sorry to throw this to you with eight minutes to, to, to go, but I think um, it, it may be something that it, at least a, a few of us would uh, appreciate. We can definitely facilitate, um, but you are right. We only have a few minutes left. So don't lie, maybe we should do one more round of questions. Okay, yeah. So I think we got some questions from the audience. I think one of the questions is actually, this is kind of related to brain, brain point about the housing and you know the importance of housing. So one of the questions asking about you know the housing affordability issue. And I think this is also related to how can we better help people. So the question is how is the housing affordability issue in shrinking cities in the two countries? Does anyone want to respond to that? And and how has the housing affordability also been affecting the shrinking cities? Well let me just mention one thing is housing housing affordability in US shrinking cities is at one level it's very high at another level it's very low. I mean it is high because housing is very inexpensive in most shrinking cities. You can get a house, not a beautiful house, but a house that you can live in in Youngstown for say $30,000, which is nothing and it's probably about 20% or more or less of the cost to replace that house. But the people who live in these cities are so poor for the most part that even housing that is very inexpensive by national standards is still too expensive for them to afford. And in fact, the government programs with the exception, we have a program called housing vouchers which affects some people, but because of limited federal appropriations, it effectively operates as a lottery. Because, you know, of every, for every family that is poor enough to be eligible for a voucher, only one out of five actually receives the voucher. So the upshot is affordability is a major problem, and yet housing is extremely inexpensive at the same time. Thank you. Yeah, on the in, on the China side, I wonder whether Professor Long can offer anything or. Yes, actually, just a quick response. I think housing affordability in my familiar shrinking cities in northeastern China. I think uh, I think that is fine. Since uh, I mean, uh, as what I have mentioned, a lot of shanty towns have been demolished, and the previous residents in shanty towns were moved to the newly built uh, multi-story buildings, I mean, resident, uh, uh, residential buildings. Uh, however, I think in Northeastern China, I think heating cost is, uh, a, I think is a potential problem since heating cost is uh, high, uh, I mean, for, uh, yeah, for, for, for 
for living in the uh, uh, for living in the housing. When I visited Yichun, Hegang, I think some local people compl complained the affordability for the heating cost. Yeah, that is my quick response. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we also got several questions that I can relate to climate change. So I think that basically, I think the question is ask, what can we learn from Shenzhen cities to prepare for climate change? And we saw this both in the pre-summit question as well as a question from the audience tonight. Anyone wants to respond to that? So what does Shenzhen cities and cities tell us about how to cope with climate change? I'll just say very briefly, I think um, shrinking cities, like all cities, are faced with challenges of climate change. So a uh, shrinking city that's on the coast may be faced with the same challenges that a growing city is on the coast. Um, however, we have to remember that shrinking cities in general are not only poor, but they're resource constrained. So dealing with climate change is clearly going to cost a lot of money. In that sense, shrinking cities are much more poorly prepared to deal with the expenses required um, to deal with climate change than a well-resourced city. If you start to look at the billions and billions of dollars that New York is beginning to spend, for example, on fortification of its coastline, et cetera. And by, through a social justice perspective, the fact that a larger percentage of shrinking city residents are socially disadvantaged and confronting inequality in their daily lives means that their level of vulnerability is also higher. So unfortunately, the burdens of climate change are going to fall more heavily, I think, on shrinking cities because of the particular situations that they're in, requiring that the government resources allocated to those cities be um, ideally more generous. But shrinking climate change, on the other hand, in a positive context in the United States may finally serve as the impetus for additional federal aid to come to cities that have had a lot of challenges getting large amounts of that aid in recent decades. Thank you. Anyone else want to add to that? And I think, you know, not just not just climate change, but also some of the other like, major disruptions we are facing, right? You know, the pandemic, you know, the technology innovations and all this have been affecting shrinking cities. So maybe I think the final question we can discuss you know, before we conclude our session is to you know, speculate about what are the futures of shrinking cities, you know, think about what challenges, opportunities those cities face these days, given everything that is going on. I don't know if this is exactly on point, but first on the question of climate change, and I think one potential advantage that shrinking cities have in the United States specifically is the amount of open land and the amount of green space that can be used for environmentally positive pursuits. On the other hand, that's not cost free either. So it's, it's going to take a lot of work, but I think it represents an opportunity. I'm not sure what the shrinking city, the future of shrinking cities is, except for one point. I think we're going to see a lot more of them in the future. The United States is likely to go into negative population growth within the next 20, give or take a few years. China is already on the cusp of negative population growth. As this trend continues, and I personally believe it's an inexorable trend, it is not going to be reversed there are going to be more and more shrinking cities. Already in the United States, we're seeing New York City, for example, which grew population for perhaps 25, 30 years, has lost population in every year for the last four years. Many other cities that are not traditional shrinking cities or legacy cities are starting to lose population. So if we have thought of this as being the exception to overall patterns of growth in the past. I think we have to start thinking about a future in which shrinkage may increasingly become the norm and growth the exception. This is a great point. I wonder whether any other speakers want to add to that? I think definitely I think the demographic shift will be a very major factor that you know, many countries are facing. 
how about technology innovation? What, what do you think about the, the new industrial revolution? Any thoughts on that? I know Professor Long has been working on some of those things. Oh, no, thanks. No, okay, that's okay. Okay, so yeah, I think it's already 10 p.m. So we have, we have used all of our time. I think those are very, we have wonderful talks and very thoughtful, you know, kind of discussion in the end. So I apologize. I think we're not able to get to many of the questions from the audience, but this is such an important topic as Adam pointed out. It is an issue that, you know, many, you know, many cities, many countries will have to face. So I hope that there will be other opportunities for this conversation to, to continue going on. So, but I want to thank our speakers for sharing their work with us. And I also want to thank the audience for joining us. Ming, do you have something to? No, I see, thank you. I see a lot of intention to share. So definitely we will be posting the recording edited version on the internet. And if you like us to add your email, we can definitely add that on the video as well. Uh, again, if this panel is interested in seeing the who asked what questions, we can prepare that file and send to you. So you can follow up with the people who have questions. But thank you so much. And I think this opened eyes to uh, a new direction for people to understand the challenges both countries have and where we can learn from each other. So thank you so much. And uh, good night and good day to our panelists. And um, see you again soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.